Hey everyone, today I thought I'd take you a little bit of behind the scenes of how I've been making the YouTube videos. I set a bunch of automations up before I clicked record on the first video. I actually recorded some videos before I recorded the first videos to uh, practice uh, recording on a daily basis, uh, how I would upload the videos to, to YouTube. This is YouTube Studio. How the uh, thumbnails would get produced how the transcriptions would get produced, how the, des the, uh, the description of each video would get uh, put together so that later on, if I wanted to, I could re-put the description back together with, uh, with any new information. Um, how it's all driven from uh, Airtable. So there's a, a bunch of, this is the final sort of table that leads to the YouTube video being uploaded, the description being updated, uh, and then there's a bunch of tables uh, that precede that. Um, this is uh, uh, where the transcriptions and, and uh, chapters are coming from. Uh, I've got a collection of large logos, small logos, uh, templates of where the thumbnails come from, um, uh, how I process the, the selfie. Um, and I know that everyone's got a, a slightly different way. This was an idea I had for how I thought I would get started. And, and in many ways, it was so that I could uh, practice and get better at some different aspects of using Make, of using Airtable. Uh, and some other uh, tools like uh, render form. So this video, I'm gonna go through the whole process uh, as best as I can, uh, given that uh, part of my process is using the iPhone that it's using to record me now. So since I can't take that, um, I've got a solution to that and I'll, I'll walk you through how I take the photo, how I turn it into uh, ultimately the, uh, the thumbnail um, and how that thumbnail ends up on my YouTube video um, and uh, we go from there. So a bit of a look at the uh, the channel so far. Uh, I would think we've been making videos for two or three weeks now. I think I've put out uh, 13 or so videos and uh, and this is super nice. That's cool. Um, and about 2,000 views and 100 hours of watch time. Lovely. Thank you for everyone that's, that's watched the video. Hopefully you learned something. Um, and if you've left a comment that uh, I, Hopefully, you know, I appreciate it. It's nice to, to chat with everyone. And uh, I also hang out on uh, the community.make. Um, and there's also uh, a Discord channel um, that uh, is available. So uh, let's have a look at the videos themselves and then uh, we'll look at making one. I've got a sample video, I've got some selfies taken, and we'll go from scratch, go through the whole flow. Uh, this was a video put out a couple of days ago. Um, and so here's the description and essentially this uh, gets built and then uploaded to YouTube. Um, the chapter headings get built with AI. The description is static um, in that it's in my flow and then it gets put together into the description. Subtitles get uh, produced as a .srt file and we'll talk about how they get uploaded. Um, I record in 4K and then we mark it public and it goes out. So let's start all the way from scratch. So typically I start by recording what I'm doing right now. Um, and then at the end of that, I'll take the selfie um, and then it all starts getting produced. Since we are recording this particular video, I can't upload that one. So I've instead made a, um, in fact, this is this file here. You can see this is the file being made. Um, I'm using OBS, um, which uh, is invisible. Um, but uh, so this is the file that's being made as record. I made a quick demo file uh, before starting. And so once I finish recording, the first thing I do is I go to here, uh, go upload, and then I'll just drop that in. And being often th half, half a gig or so, it'll take some time to upload. In this case, it won't take too long. And uh, you go through next. I don't need to fill anything in because this is all updated programmatically using make.com uh, later on. So leave it as unlisted and we're good to go. That's that. Um, the next thing I would do is I would then, uh, so I've got an OBS app um, on my phone. Uh, I think it cost me some money, uh, obs.camera. So this is what I have on my phone that's uh, recording and sending it to the OBS app uh, and then it becomes that overlay. Then I have some hotkeys which let me uh, change the format so I don't need to do any post-processing. I can just uh, pick a different scene using some hotkeys um, and that's pretty cool. That seems to work nicely. I just have to remember where my head is 
Um, so that's Alt Command 2, Alt Command 4 I think now is in the bottom corner, um, and Alt Command 1 is full screen, and 3 is gets rid of it altogether. Uh, and that is sort of, so the, this little app uh, sends it through uh, into OBS on my laptop. Then, um, so once that's finished, I'll go to the iPhone uh, camera app. I'll take a bunch of photos, which is still the most awkward part. Um, and eventually you'll pick one that uh, somehow captures the spirit of whatever it is you think you're doing. Um, this is me looking at my camera, looking pensive. I'm not sure what makes a good, eye for, uh, a good uh, thumbnail. In no way am I can educate you on that. Uh, but then um, I tend to uh, turn the live mode off because it's a little easy for the next step. Uh, and then what you do is you hold your finger down on the person and, uh, and then iPhone figures out where the outline of that person is. And you can sort of move them around, which is relevant, but it shows that you've captured, uh, that it's captured the outline. And then uh, it leaves a little button, a little pop-up with share. And that's how I then upload it to uh, Google Drive. So I have a folder on my Google Drive called Selfies. I give it a name. And uh, this name is actually uh, um, meaningful. So the fact that it has a hyphen left, uh, that metadata is pulled out by make.com and put into Airtable. And it helps me filter out or match up which set of thumbnails uh, the image goes with. So that's, that all happens on my phone. And because I'm using my phone to record, I can't show it to you. So I took some screenshots. So at this point, this file is now on Google Drive. If you've ever done anything with Google Drive, you know that Google Drive, as far as I'm aware, has no way to notify me that a new file has been added or modified. There's no web hooks for Google Drive. And so we need a solution to uh, triggering the scenario for make.com. Um, similarly, we have no way to trigger that a file has been uploaded to YouTube. Um, and uh, so I'm going to talk to you first about uh, those triggers and the rest of the flow. So here is uh, what is about 19 different uh, scenarios. I don't think I use some of them for another subset of videos. So before I started producing the final YouTube videos, uh, I started producing what I was calling to myself daily videos and that I would just make for myself, talk about what I was doing Monday. Uh, it was handy because then I could build this uh, workflow every day. Um, in a low stress environment uh, because it was just for me. So daily videos were for me, uh, they're private. YouTube, the YT ones are the, the ones that ultimately go up to YouTube. So some of these are, are duplicated, but I've numbered them. Uh, this is what I often do within a, a, a scenario folder is I number them. So because often there's a flow, a sequence to how these, how you can think about them. And, uh, and then they might be numbered or you know, ordered within that grouping. Um, so we start off uh, in the flow with the selfie in that I have taken that selfie, uh, uploaded to Google Drive, and now I need to uh, get Google, I need to pull it from Google Drive. I need to add the white boundary around the outline, outside that looks quite nice, um, and then save that all to Airtable so I can use it later on to build the whole thumbnail. So I mentioned before, I've got the problem of, I've uploaded to Google Drive, but I have no way to trigger Google Drive. The method I'm currently using is the uh, make.com iPhone app. So you may have, uh, if you have an iPhone or a, um, an app, a Google Drive, there is uh, these uh, modules, the Apple iOS module. Um, let's see if we can find the make.com iPhone app. So we can find a screenshot. Uh, so there it is there. Let's just see if this, this will be fine. Um, so what I've got is these uh, buttons. So I've created a button, I've got two buttons. One to say there's a new selfie and another one to say there's a new um, YouTube video. And essentially these buttons uh, trigger webhooks, so to speak, in make.com. But it's, uh, it's these watch button modules. So if I open this up, you'll see there's a process selfies button ID. And so on my phone, there is, uh, I've added a button and the tag on that button, the button ID is process selfies. And so when I click that, and I've also got it as a, um, a shortcut in the shortcuts app um, because I find that convenient as well. So that comes through um, and uh, we'll run this. Since I'm using my phone, I can't trigger it, but um, 
we could uh, run this once. No, I can't. So uh, I can run this. So this is, um, I'll run it in a second, right? So what is this? This is uh, make themselves has a way to run their own other scenarios, which is quite nice. So the, 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 there's a scenario which I'm about to show you, which does the work of pulling the file off Google Drive, sending it off to get the white outline and then storing an Airtable. And so there's like these, these two scenarios go together in a pair. One scenario is watching for the iPhone button to be clicked and it tells the second scenario to run. And I think I built it that way so that I could develop the first one and run the first one independently. Um, so the first, the, so, sorry, so the first scenario is for the, I guess, optional button press. And the second scenario does the work. And I sort of separate those out. Um, for my own benefit. So if I was to run this uh, module, it would actually go off to the second module, uh, to the second scenario, I'm sorry, um, and run it. And the reason, actually, I, I now remember, there's a, there's a good reason for um, for this, is that because I'm starting this uh, scenario with uh, watch files in a folder module, and it likes to be first, um, because it will go and find anything new. And so, the first scenario triggers the second scenario, and when the second scenario runs, um, and you can sort of see it's on demand, um, it will go off and find any new files. Uh, and uh, so I tell you what, I'll run this now because we have a new file. I've uploaded it. Uh, this is the new file. I uploaded a few minutes ago. That's me looking spectacular. And what we need it to do now is to uh, be pulled down, download from Google Drive. Uh, we extract the file names out, so I sort of pull some 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 names out. Um, I then look for whether or not it has a hyphen left or hyphen right in the name. It's a bit of metadata. I have this pattern that I've used uh, to try to communicate something along the way. To say this person is on the left side of the thumbnail or the right side of the thumbnail. Um, the next time I ever do this video, I may have totally different ideas of how this all should work. Um, now, the, the, the part of how do I get the white outline? Uh, I use Cloudinary. So Cloudinary is, uh, for many people, a place to, as a CDN, a place to upload images and then be able to dynamically pull down different shapes and sizes and versions and permutations. Uh, they're cached and stored around the world and then it's really fast. Very handy for websites. Um, and so you can upload raw files and then as you're designing the site, you can just say what size you actually need. Um, in here somewhere is a uh, cloudinary white outline is a feature where you can add borders to image outline effect. There it is. So essentially I'm using this feature to add an outline. Now, if I hadn't already done the uh, transparency and, and already have the, uh, if I hadn't already uh, taken away the background, it actually would have put a, a white background around the entire square. So because I've already done the transparency here, it will uh, put the white outline just around the edge of this transparent image. So this is what we're using. Um, so uh, here, so this apply white. So this is the transformation E outline outer. It's going to be white, it's 25 pixels. Um, and so if you can think about it, the bulk of the purpose of this scenario really is to run this module just here. Um, and so if we, we start there, if that's the, if that's the core idea, this uh, here, everything else is, is wrapper just to get that to work. In order to apply the outline, the file needs to be uploaded to Cloudinary in the first place. So Cloudinary will have the original and uh, the white outline. I want that white outline um, I decided eventually that I wanted to download that and store it in, in uh, Airtable as opposed to leave it on uh, Cloudinary. I think there was a reason for that, but I cannot remember what that reason is anymore. But I ended up putting all my assets inside Airtable as opposed to leaving them um, like on Google Drive or on, on Cloudinary. I tried to various different, different approaches, but in the end, I use I'm using Airtable as sort of like the store of all my image assets. So that's where we finish there. We stay there by, we end up putting the file in the selfies table 
um, and we'll see shortly that a new row is added here with the new selfie. Um, and to go back, so again, the whole point of this scenario is to run this. Everything before it is to pull it down from the original place, upload it to Cloudinary, apply the white transform, download it again, and then upload it to Airtable. That's what this scenario does. So when I run this, I'm gonna run it manually, but normally I'd press the button on my phone. Um, we will see a new row added here. So it found one new image found one new image. Um, you can see that it parsed out the left value. Um, it has uploaded it to Cloudinary. It has applied the white outline. And what we get is a URL. And you know, maybe I could have used that URL. So there is what uh, is produced from Cloudinary. You can see me with a white outline. Um, and then I download that using the, just the HTTP module. Um, that's the, uh, get a file, uh, get a file module. Um, that turns it into a data, data object. And then I uh, create a new record in the selfie table where um, we use some of the metadata, uh, the dates, just as some sort of unique slug. I have a, a column, a custom column called side, uh, which has that left or right value. Um, the URL, so there's a, a, let me have a look. So here is this new column, a uh, new row that we just added. Now we'll have a look at what this looks like and then we'll uh, talk about how I put it in there. Um, so you can see that there is a, a side column, an image column, which um, I call it image, but it's, it's uh, an, uh, attachments. So if we look at edit field, you can see that it's a type attachment. And so the way the uh, Airtable create a record module works is um, we just give it a URL and it will download that URL. So the URL needs to be public. Um, that's fine. And then it will give it to, we don't care about the file name. Uh, the original URL, I don't think I actually use these columns anymore. Um, and uh, some other fields that we don't use and they use later on. So that, that scenario, so that's the starting point. We have now created um, this new uh, this new uh, record uh, in Airtable ready to be used inside a thumbnail. Okay. Meanwhile, okay, I've done that. Meanwhile, there was also this video that I uploaded. Now, normally this video is half an hour to, to an hour. And thank you for anyone that watched a one hour video. And so it now needs to be transcribed. And I'm, I'm still in the process of looking at transcriptions. Um, and I've done videos on transcriptions. And it, actually the way I'm doing it at the moment is not how I've done the video. And it doesn't mean that this way is right. It's just, I have this working and I haven't yet decided to change it to something else. But I'm gonna explain how I do it right now, um, but it doesn't make it the best way. But first we need to tell uh, make.com that there is a new video and that it should process it. So let's exit this scenario and we'll look at the, uh, the video processing. Um, actually, I apologize. So. Next, we actually look at rendering the, uh, the images. Um, but what I'm talking about, and I will come back to that, I apologize. Um, the next is uh, telling make.com that there is a new video. And it's very similar to the, uh, the selfie one. It will have the, um, let's skip a step. This is part two. These are not as ordered as we'd like. Button, this one here, sorry, my mistake. So this is very similar to the uh, selfie. It's like it goes in two parts. Uh, this is the one that captures the fact that I pressed a button. Uh, this button's called fetch new YouTube videos and there'll be a button on my phone and it uses the make module to run a make scenario, which is quite useful. You just find the scenario idea or search for it. And I could manually run that, but we need to go and talk about that scenario first. Okay, so there's the button and here is the, um, the scenario itself. So when this scenario is run, triggered by the previous scenario, or today I will run this manually, um, it fetches any new videos that it finds in a channel. Uh, in my channel, um, just find me the latest one. 
and then uh, it processes them one of two ways. And remember, I mentioned that I had some daily videos um, when I was first starting, and before, really before I started publishing publicly, I had these daily videos. Um, and I slightly processed them uh, slightly differently. I had a different thumbnail and a few different things. And really, I think I was just playing around. But if uh, the video has the title Daily Log, it goes off and does some other stuff. But really what we want is this one. Is uh, This is the, the flow that will happen when I run this scenario. It will uh, take the information it found from the YouTube uh, API and create a new record in the YT videos table. So we will get a new... Uh, row down here um, representing that that video ID. Essentially what we're really looking for is the video ID of this new video that we'll be using to update it later on. The next thing we do is to, we run a big long background job to get the transcription and the chapter headings. Um, uh, and uh, so when do I talk about that? I, I do want to talk about that and it's using a site called Civ Data. Uh, which is really a, a bit like Appify, Appify um, and other sorts of places where they all have a different brand for what they're really doing, which is running some code somewhere on this, on the, or using AWS EC2 or Cloud Function Serverless. Um, it's it's a, a nicely branded way to run some code that probably someone else wrote uh, and you pay by the second or by the minute for that code running. So Apple 5 sort of brands itself as, hey, we do, you know, for deploying web scraping and data extraction and anything else that useful. Um, and what's missing here might be video and audio processing, but they could be doing video and audio processing. They just haven't added it to their website. Civ, on the other hand, is doing, I think, arguably the same job, um, but they're sort of trying to make it easier to think about and process uh, API and video. So I started using uh, them and uh, um, and so this is where um, we, uh, this is where I've been processing the videos to, to this point. And so five days ago, I did the last one and we'll, we'll see another one pop up here. And then I'll show you where that code is and you can use it yourself. Um, you can see it's actually my own uh, YouTube transcript analyzer script. I just wanted to I modified a couple of things to make it work, which is partly why I haven't explained it. It's kind of complex, but completely reusable by, by you. Um, so uh, once we run this, you can see it, it runs a calls a make hook. That is surprising. Am I calling my own thing? All right, maybe that will make sense in a short moment. This doesn't look like it does what I thought it does. So we'll, we'll come back to that. Let's, uh, let's run this. Um, no, I, I desperately need to know. If there's something like that, so this is a make hook. And there is no way to find out what this does. I just, I can't believe how make thinks. Like, how am I supposed to map this back to something? If you find a make web hook in the world that looks like this, I'm not sure there's a way to figure out what it goes to. So these are some of the frustrating things I have with make. Um, in fact, I have a list. Uh, I have a list of frustrating things. Um, given a webhook URL, how can I find what webhook and scenario it goes to? All right, don't need you. Don't need you. All right, let's find out what's next. Um, here we go. I think this is what it's running here. So um, this is separated out probably so I could, I could do testing. So that other scenario is basically calling out to this scenario. Um, uh, I probably could also have used the make modules for this. I think you can pass parameters. I just don't think I knew that at the time and I was using webhooks to communicate from one scenario to another scenario. Uh, as you can see, the downside of that is the, the the webhook URL has no metadata in it to tell you which what it's calling. But I feel confident that previous scenario is going to call this scenario, which will uh, then go off to run sieve data uh, and to call a uh, particular function that I wrote, passing in a parameter that I will. And I think what we'll do is I'll describe this uh, later on. Um, we'll just get this running. 
and then we register it. So I've, we're sort of spanning out. Well, I haven't yet talked about thumbnails and I've started to introduce the idea of the videos and then there's the idea of the transcription. So let's run this one and at least get our records taken. So when I run this, I can click this arrow or I can press command enter. It will find that new video that I just uploaded. It will uh, add that to a table and then we'll trigger that other scenario. So we should now see uh, this new video here, which is you know the URL, the, the thing, and there's lots of, of fields that uh, um, will get updated later on. Um, and uh, when we make a thumbnail, then we'll allocate the thumbnail to this video. And I mentioned that it will now go off and run that six audio chapters. It is currently sort of 829. So there's the 828 execution that happened in the background. You can see that it went off and successfully called this API and then it registered this, the job in Airtable. So let me just show you where I put that. I have this save transactions uh, transcriptions table. And it's, uh, it's already finished. Normally it takes a lot longer. I was confused briefly because it, uh, it had finished already. Um, but it's such a short video, it's probably already finished. Um, and if we go here and refresh this page, you'll see, yes, it finished already. Um, and what did that do uh, before we worry about it? It uh, downloads, uh, does essentially it creates the transcription using Whisper and then rewrites all that into what is the data format of an SRT file. The SRT file is what YouTube would like to be uploaded for all the closed captions. Um, so there's a very specific format for that. And all I'm doing is taking the metadata and rewriting it out into the SRT format. It's all inside the sieve, uh, sieve um, function that I'm calling. That's one of the things it does. The other thing it does is it pulls out the chapter headings. That's not a very interesting one. Um, it uses the whisper model to sort of, uh, uh, to get the transcription. And then from the transcription, it sort of does the, it come up with some chapter titles. And you can sort of see that they're, they're manufactured. And I typically have a read through to see if there's anything silly that I can just remove, or maybe it's broken and it needs to be doing. But nonetheless, for the very short uploaded temp test video, it came up with two. Um, okay. And this is going to be automatically put into, uh, um, I can download the SRT file. And if we go and have a look, uh, what does that look like? It looks like this. Um, and, uh, and we don't really need to look at it. It's going to be uploaded to YouTube. And in fact, let's do that now. We go and have a look at this video. I would very much like this to be automated and I have tried, but I failed to this degree to this point. Uh, the time of recording, I have not yet found a way to upload this, um, to upload this SRT file. So there's the transcription. It pops it in and uh, for each of the different places, um, you can sort of see what it looks like. That's done. That's about one of the few um, uh, slightly manual steps. Um, okay, so we've got our transcription and we've got our selfie. What we need now is to build a YouTube um, thumbnail and then we can produce the video. To make the YouTube thumbnail, I just make a new uh, row here um, and uh, we think of a title. So this particular video um, is about my YouTube workflow. Um, I could call it YouTube workflow. Um, and uh, we'll come back to the video title. So this, these two titles go in the, in the, um, the thumbnail itself. Uh, we now need some, uh, some images. Um, it'll probably be the big make image would be the big one uh, and maybe some small ones um, as we use Airtable and I, I have like the, the, um, the thumbnail if we look at render flow because you'll see I have a selection of thumbnail sort of um, templates and they either have uh, one image um, you can sort of see it at the top there is either one image or three images um, or three 
That's annoying that I put my mouse over it. So this one to the left, to the right column over here, you can see it's got one wide logo and one short logo or small logo or square logo. Um, this one in the middle here has just a wide one. Um, and this one over here has got three, three, uh, three small ones. So it looks like if I want, okay, here's, so here's where I can have a wide one and two short ones. Um, and I would have one, so that's a, a this one here is uh, me on the right. And this one over here is the same, but me on the left, which is what we'll be using today. So this is probably the one we'll be using today because I will also add another, uh, what else could we use? What is another logo? We use render form to make the, uh, the images. The selfie, uh, it automatically filters all the selfies in the selfie table to just a selfie taken in the last day or taken today. So it's pretty much going to be that one. That saves me from having to find it amongst a big list. It, uh, when you write um, filter record by selection, where uploaded is today. So I can only pick a selfie that was taken today. Um, then we find a template. Uh, now I've broken this prior to recording, which is annoying, but it should also do a filter as well. But essentially we're looking for, um, yeah, that looks like the right one. We'll find out shortly. Um, but it has the numbers matching. We'll find that in a second. So now we can press build. There are multiple ways to do automations from Airtable into make multiple being possibly two. One of them is to use uh, you know, automations um, where based on a change that occurred, uh, you could then call out to make a webhook. What I've opted for here is to build a button. And this button essentially builds that there's the webhook uh, URL there and I build out the other attributes that are going to be passed in um, and sent off to, uh, to, the, to the webhook. To, to, the, to the make scenario that builds the image. And now what you've seen is that uh, I clicked that and this page here came up. Um, and that was the image rendered. So uh, when I clicked that button, it went off to a make scenario and it actually redirected me back to the image that it produced. Not because it's important, because like, why not? It's like useful, I can have a quick look at the image, I can go, oh, I don't like this, um, this is fine. Um, where is I'm missing my icon? So I've obviously picked the wrong one. I've picked the wrong one because I can't see what I'm doing. Ah. So we'll pick a different one. So left hand side. I guess we should go over here. It was this one. Edit. I've got to fix this. So it's this glossy lobsters itch warmly. 1936. It's this one here. Itchy, itch. Glossy lobsters itch warmly. That one there. Let's press build again. I will show you the uh, the make scenario that's doing this work. Um, and there it is there. So there's the, the wide logo and the two square logos. Uh, there's the, the text number one and text number two, and there is today's selfie. Now you can see it doesn't sit nicely. And, and it's this type of issue here is why I may not stick with this methodology um, for eternity. Essentially now I have to lower this down and press save and press build again. It's a little tedious. It's like, well, why am I programmatically building these images if I have to change the template? There you go, that looks fine. And um, and where I'm at in my YouTube career is fine is good enough because we're looking to produce these um, and move on. Um, and I haven't yet, you know, found that, I don't know. I will get better at, at YouTube template uh, themes, uh, better at YouTube thumbnails eventually, but this is uh, pretty nice. Um, and uh, and it's in, and I'm, I'm having a lovely time sharing with you how it works. So uh, let's come back. Let's find out where this build goes. Once again, if I edit field, I'm given the webhook. And once again, I have no way that I'm aware of to easily figure out what that goes to. No, I think that's terrible. But I have grouped them all in one place. 
and we will hopefully be able to figure out which one it goes to. Um, so we are now at, uh, no, we're not at the render. Yes, yeah, so we're at the render thumbnail uh, from Airtable. So it's this one here. So when I press that build button, it is coming in to Airtable button to trigger build. That's the, if we could, we can compare that copy address. So we've got ends in 5x08, 5x08. Okay, so those two match up. Um, so it's coming in here um, and, and doing the work. So what does it do? In fact, let's, uh, let's go back to the one Incomplete resolution. How did that not happen? Okay, let's ignore that for now. Uh, this one here was the one we just did. Um, and so it came in and let's have a look at the values. So I passed in this um, record ID. I don't think I'm using name, but it's useful for debugging. Uh, and this record ID allows us to then fetch that record using the, um, using the get a record. And so now we get all the values. And this is what we use to build um, the image. We are going to use uh, title one, title two, um, and our logos, etc., etc., etc. All right. But to understand which of these we use, we need to understand how the render form system works, and then we'll figure out what it is that uh, how I'm passing this in. So the render for, render the render flow. So render flow is this uh, templating. Uh, so I say render flow. It is called render form. Uh, one of the reasons I liked it versus some of the other uh, image generation systems that uh, I'd looked at was that it wasn't a monthly subscription. It was a sort of pay for a batch of credits. So even though it has a page you go, I don't see a need to use that. There's essentially, uh, no, sorry, this is, this is actually what I'm using. Ignore the blue box. You don't need the blue box. Uh, you just need the pay as you go and you buy credits and eventually you use them. And I like that a lot more than having to put, than paying $19 every month, even if I don't use uh, the credits, um, even if the credits compound, I just don't need it. I know they put a blue box around it and encourage you to use it, um, but uh, I'm happily, uh, I started with $9, uh, kept using them, ran out of 100 credits, paid for 500, um, and I'm enjoying the service. So that's why I'm using RenderFlow, RenderForm. Obviously I have no appreciation for their name. Um, now the way that we render it, uh, we're using make.com and they have a module, but you don't need to, you could use it from outside. Um, so let's have a look at how, uh, we might, uh, apply. So when, when it comes to rendering an image, we fundamentally need to know which image are we using? In which case it would be this sort of identifier, that number. And um, and then which of these fields we want to override? Uh, we kind of want to override a lot of them. Um, we want a different image. We want different uh, line text. You can sort of see this as title, uh, title.text. And over here, this is the parameter name that we're going to be overriding. So uh, are we overriding title.text, title2.text, um, and then the selfie.source, and logo two source, logo one source, and logo wide one source. And you can see that they are URLs, not data objects. Uh, so we need a public URL for the images and we need some text. And this is how we're gonna uh, uh, upload the data to generate our image. So let's come back. Let's have a look what we did pass through. Um, so for selfie.source, I passed through a Cloudinary URL. It's interesting. Uh, for title.text, I passed in the word YouTube. For title2, I passed in the word workflow. Um, and uh, for logo square one source, there is a URL. And if you look, you can see it came from Airtable content. So this image, I've got, I've gotten a, I have received a URL 
to the asset from Airtable itself. Uh, similarly for logo two, logo three I didn't use, logo one wide, a logo two wide wasn't being used in this template and there is another concept of a wide image that I'm not using. And then there's the, uh, the, the template identifier, the glossy lobsters itch warmly in 1936. Uh, so this is the parameters we're passing through. Um, render flow gives us back a URL for the image. Let's have a look at what that looks like. That was there. And in fact, that was what we redirected to over here. Um, but I have a set of, I'm liking storing my assets inside Airtable at the moment. So then I upload the image uh, from the URL back into um, back into uh, the system. So you can see I store it as the rendered image URL. That was the original image that Airtable gave to me. Oh, sorry, that was the URL that render form gave to me. But I now have an image stored um, on Airtable. So what's that look like? Dun, 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 dun. This is the rendered attachment. So this image was uploaded from make.com um, so that I have the image permanently inside Airtable. So if render form ever throws it away, I've got a, a copy of it permanently. Um, and the uh, here is the original URL that I was given from render form, which may expire at some point. So, um, okie dokie. So, how did we get those URLs for uh, tables? Because uh, I found, as a database person, as, as someone who's done some, some coding in the past, where you can have tables that link to other tables, link to other tables, when you go to fetch that, you can write a SQL expression that links three or four, 10 tables together. And you can say, well, I want fields from different tables and they're sort of brought up to your request. With Airtable uh, and make.com, I found that I need to do that work before. So what I've got here is I link the nested tables back up into mine. What do I mean by that? I uh, picked, for, for one, you can see that I've got the images that I'm using inside the table, but I didn't put them there. Like you watched me and I did not put these images there. Instead, I was over here and I picked these, uh, I added fields here. So I put make there and now this is gone. And when I put uh, make back, you can see it's back here. So this column here is a lookup. We go to the logo wide uh, column and we pull the logo file object. So let's have a look at the logo large so here are my large images, my wide images. And if I was to pick make, then this image is stored in another table, which is how I would normally do a database with you know one concept per concern. But I need it to be brought back up into the YouTube thumbnails table so that when I fetch that entire row out of the table, I've got the files as well. So I've done the lookup inside this table um, one, it's pretty and I can see what they look like. But very importantly, two, it's so that when I pull this uh, row back down later, you know, when I pull it back down, I have um, the uh, selfie, the, uh, the logo wide files. I have the image. If all I had was the original uh, link, then I just have this record, then I have to go and fetch it separately. And it would cost a lot of operation and, and possibly quite complicated. So instead, I do all the work inside of Airtable. And now I get the URLs um, that I can give to uh, render form. So this is a lookup. Uh, so just to recap, we have uh, children tables or secondary tables that have the images. Okay. And then I have a parent table where I select uh, where I select which images I want. This is a selfie example, and over here is the uh, 
uh, linking to those tables. So the selfies tables is very similar in concept. It's like a child table. Here is where I select a row from that table. But here is where I do the lookup so that the, uh, the file is available to me when I pull the whole record down. And with that file is a URL. And with that URL, I can give it to render form and it builds out the entire image. If I've, I've, whilst in my head, I've explained this two or three times. If it's still not working, um, let me know in the comments and I'll build a dedicated video of, of uh, building out something smaller um, of how this would work. So finally, we uh, redirect. So this is interesting. I, I want to go and um, show you this in case you've not seen this idea before. Remember when I click the button to build, um, it opened a new page, a new tab. Okay. Now the primary job was not to open the tab. The primary job was that it, uh, it invoked that URL, which was a webhook to a make scenario and all the work happened. Now, I, um, if, if you do that, if you have one of these and you don't have a webhook response, you'll notice that it just says accepted. Um, and that's like an asynchronous webhook, a standard webhook. But when you build your make scenario, you can also add a webhook response. Uh, commonly, you'll have a status of 200 and maybe a body that says thanks or you know some sort of response or maybe some HTML. But you can actually also have 302, which is an HTTP status code that says um, at this URL, the thing you're looking for, it's not here. I need you, you know, it's telling the browser, please redirect to this other URL. And that's what the 302 status is. 302 status is uh, to tell you that to look somewhere else for the object. And by the way, if you're new to HTTP statuses, let me give you the quickest of overviews. The 200 range, whether it's 200, 201, are for uh, getting something, something successfully. You asked for something, here is a URL, give me that thing. Um, 200 is the most common. It's when you're using the internet, uh, behind the scenes, it's a bunch of requests that are all 200s. Um, if you create something for the first time, uh, the response code might be 201, but nonetheless, we call those the 200s. They're kind of like the success. The 300s are redirects. The most common is 302, which is to say that something is temporarily somewhere else. Um, a status of 301 is uh, permanently somewhere else. It's like, just never bother coming to this URL. It's always going to be there. Um, but the 300s are the redirect. The 400s are user error. Um, 404 means this page is not found. 401 or 400 is like you're not authorized to do something or you're not logged in. And then the 500s, are, there's an internal error. If you've been around on the internet since the early days, uh, you'll remember uh, they often be... Uh, the webmaster has been notified of this error. There's no webmaster and he's not looking at any logs. Um, but typically that would be a 500 status. So, but we're using 302 and the 302 allows us to redirect. But the way it works is we need to return a header. So you'll notice I didn't put the URL in the body. Instead, I added a custom header and it's this location and the URL is what makes the 302 work. So this is uh, how you can have a make scenario with a webhook where the response is a redirect to something else. You put 302 a key, and, and then a header with the key location and the URL as the value. And it's awesome. Though that is how the button worked. That is how when I press this build, um, now at the, the scenario is running and when the scenario finishes running, I get redirected to this page. Super awesome. Certainly uh, super useful to know. And if I haven't explained that, well, please let me know in the comments and I'll, uh, I'll make a video on it. So we have now uh, processed the selfie and added the white outline. We have uh, converted the selfie plus some logos and some text into the thumbnail, which is now stored on Airtable. We have notified make.com that I had a new YouTube video, which has now put a, a record in Airtable. I have not yet uploaded the thumbnail to YouTube. So let's go and do that. So once again, we, we're over here. This is my video that I've uploaded. 
um, over here, what we haven't yet done is linked the YouTube record with the thumbnail record. And so there it is there. And you can see it linked it. That's a similar lookup. So this is a, a lookup into the thumbnail column to say, go and get the rendered attachment from that other table and show it in line. And I might be doing that mostly because it's awesome. No, I'm, I'm doing it because for the same idea as before, it means that when I run this next make scenario, I'll have access to that image immediately and I won't have to do a second lookup. Um, what else? Um, if I was to give this a better name, making sweet YouTube, uh, I think this gets uploaded. So I'm going to click this button. Um, and if you look in the bottom left hand corner, you'll see that it is a, uh, another make webhook. Just like we did with the rendering the file button, we have a, a webhook where we pass the record ID um, and we go from there. And just like before, I have no idea which one this goes to. And it is super annoying. Uh, if you would come back a year from now, want to know how all this works. Luckily, you've made a YouTube video to describe it to yourself. Um, so let's see if we can figure out where this comes back to. Um, and it would come back to this upload thumbnail from Airtable to YouTube. But we should, of course, check. Uh, it ends in, oh, can't even see. So ridiculous. It starts with, I'm not sure that I can trust the start. It ends with 8EPL. Uh, 8EPL. Okay, so those webhooks match up and you can see how ridiculous that is. So when I click that button, when I click the uh, the upload button, it will come into this scenario. Now let's have a look what it does. Um, all I get is the record ID, which is fine because I will then use the get a record module to fetch that record. Um, download the thumbnail. It will then upload it to YouTube using the YouTube module. Uh, it will then set some video details. Um, and then I'll give a webhook response, which will uh, say thanks or something. And then we'll record the upload timestamp. That seems like a nice idea. So let's, uh, I'll, I'll just run this here and we'll click upload. So we can see it flowing through. It's, fit, it's pulled down the YouTube video from uh, Airtable. It's uploaded to YouTube and uh, redirected. And, it, and on this occasion, I didn't redirect anywhere. I just uh, said, uh, you can close this now. And in fact, the whole uh, image, the whole panel eventually, uh, the browser window, the browser tab eventually closed, which is quite nice. Let's have a look at how all that worked. Oh, first, let's just check that this works. So let's refresh the video. And you can now see that my sweet, sweet thumbnail is here, that the title that I gave it is here. Um, and I believe it's set some other uh, bits and pieces as well. What we haven't done yet is the description, um, which is coming. So what did it do? Uh, as I said, it fetched the record using the record ID that I passed through in the webhook. Uh, it pulled down all the videos, uh, all, the, all the attributes. Now, because I had done the lookup, uh, I'll automatically get the thumbnail attachment included in that record. So I don't need to go and fetch it in a second request, which is fantastic. That, UR, that URL right there is going to be handy. I then use that URL and I download it. Now, why do I do that? Ideally, I wouldn't have to. Ideally, I could just give it to YouTube and say, hey, YouTube, go and get the thumbnail from over there. Alas, that is not how the YouTube module works. And I guess it's not how the YouTube API works. You need to actually upload the file. So because the YouTube module requires us to give it a file or you know, a data map. Uh, therefore, we need to get the file. And so we use the HTTP library to download the, 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 the thumbnail into Make to then upload it to, uh, to YouTube. Um, the set of thumbnail video, uh, the, uh, so this module is just for setting the thumbnail. 
We then have another module for updating other attributes. So for example, also all of them are in science and technology. I make sure it's unlisted still. This is not made for kids. Uh, the license recording date probably could set that, um, but it, it was already set two minutes ago. Uh, allow embedding and any other sorts of things. And I'll set the title. The description will come soon. Uh, I mentioned that in the for the uh, for the rendering button, uh, I did a redirect, a 302, and I mentioned the 200 is success. And so I can just send back some uh, some HTML. What you saw was you can close this window now. <laughs> but what I've got here is a little bit of JavaScript that waits uh, 10 seconds and then automatically closes the tab. Um, so that's a bit of fun. Um, and uh, it's just a cute little bit. Um, if uh, if you uh, if you're interested in this, uh, let me know and I'll, I'll put it uh, in the description somewhere. But um, you should be able to copy and paste that. Uh, but yes, essentially it um, waits ten, waits ten seconds and then closes the window. Uh, and then we record a, a time a update on times ten because that seems like a nice idea to confirm that it's successful. All right, so we're getting very close. We have, um, we've got the selfie, we've turned it into a thumbnail, and now we've uploaded the thumbnail into YouTube. We downloaded the SRT file for the closed captions and we manually uploaded to YouTube. The last step is the description. So here it is here. Um, And then, uh, then uh, if we've got time, uh, I'll try to remember to go back to the Civ data thing because um, that job can be long running and there is a webhook that comes back in uh, to talk about, uh, to tell us that it's finished. Uh, because on this occasion it was very small, it didn't take very long and it was finished faster than it started. Uh, let me just do some, some housekeeping. Delete all. Thank you for your patience. Okay, um, so when I click this update button here, again, I should double check that it is going to the right place, but it comes in and runs this scenario. Um, and you can see this pattern now. I've got 302 redirect to video URL. I highly recommend you put nice descriptions on your modules. You're missing, you. You need to think about future you. You love future you. You want the best for future you, except for that bag of chips you ate last night. Um, sometimes we do a little bit for, for current you, but you want to think about future you. And future you is going to come back to your scenarios and not know what any of them do. Um, and pretty much the module name is the best and only way you've got to describe what the th things do. Um, you've also got notes, but I haven't found those to be super useful but they're better than nothing. So start with names and then you've got notes. So 302 redirect to video URL. It's pretty descriptive of what this scenario does at the end. And you can see that pattern of 302, then add a custom header, location and URL. I actually would rather that went to something else, but uh... all right. So we're now gonna build the description. Um, I've got some static text in here about uh, what I want to go in for the about me um, looks fine. Um, I will download the uh, record from Airtable for the YouTube video. It's going to have some, uh, some, some bits and pieces. I will fetch the, uh, um, I'm not sure that I should have touched that. Let's just leave that the way it was. Um, I will, um, uh, I don't think I need you. Uh, fetch the chapter timestamps and then we build the full description. So right here is where we build what goes into the description. And then we use the uh, update YouTube to set that description. I overwrite the title one more time. That wasn't necessary. And we don't bother seeing these things again. And then I redirect. Um, so let's see if this works. Here you go. I sound, I sound suspicious, like it's not worked in the past. Okay, and it is redirected. Let's have a look, let's refresh and see what we got. Okay, 
So we got our timestamps, that's excellent. Uh, we got this part, which was static inside our make scenario. Uh, we did not get uh, a preview of the description. The reason for that is I never wrote one. Um, here is where I could write in advance the description. This will be a great video. All right, so if I edit that now um, and press update one more time, press refresh, this will be a great video is added. So you can see this whole description is built from some static text, which I could change about myself. I could change this and then rerun it for all the videos and all the videos will get an updated uh, about me. Uh, the chapters came from that table and uh, this came from, from the YouTube table as well. The only thing left to publish this video is update, upload the subtitles, which we did and change the video to public and you would be like, that is done. That is done. This is my process explained very slowly. So the last thing for us to share, I think, is just to explain a little bit about the Civ data, the subtitles, um, if only as a, a brief intro, um, because uh, there's just a, a little bit of complexity to making, uh, to getting told. Um, so over here in Civ data transcriptions, if I had a big long one, what you'd see is that the, when we start the transcriptions, that the new row gets created, um, but it hasn't finished yet um, because it's still waiting to be, uh, to be processed. And so we need to be told eventually that it's finished because it took take five, 10 minutes. So let's have a quick um, look at the, uh, right, so it's under section under the six. So we've got, so just to recap what we looked at before, um, when we discover a new YouTube video, the last thing we do is we then start this scenario, which um, we then ask sieveData.com to take the YouTube video, download the video, strip out the audio, give it to whisper the, AI model to get a transcript and uh, all the segments that are going to be used to make the closed caption file. And then we ask it to generate some chapter headings. All that is happening on Civ data. I could be doing some of it on make.com and I may in the future. Um, but when I built this the first time, I found Civ.data and I got it to work. And it, I'm sure we've all had the experience of knowing our automations could be different, but they work. Let's leave them alone. However, it does take some time. I, I don't just sit here waiting for it to finish. Instead, I just start it and I ignore it. What I wait for is I wait for it to finish with another um, scenario. So this is a scenario where it's, it's an authentic webhook. I am waiting for another system to tell me something is finished. And so if we look here, uh, you can sort of see it's called Receive Civ Response for Audio Transcription. And this is a webhook that I would have given Civ somewhere. Let's have a look if I can find out where it is. Uh, jobs, apps, or maybe I pass it. Come on, YouTube, where was it? Audio transcript. Let's have a look. Do I pass it here? All right, so when I request each video be uh, processed, I actually give it the webhook of where to be, of, of, I, I tell it uh, what webhooks to call and under what job um, events. So when do I want to be told about something? And all I want to be told about is when the job is complete, whether it's errored or succeeded. The error is important because it tends to error. So whether, whether the job, uh, let's have a look at jobs again, whether it succeeded or whether it errored, as you can see, it errored a bunch, a lot in a row. Um, and if it errors, I wish to know about it and just try again because if we look at the errors and the errors aren't really meaningful, 
Um, something ha bad happened in Magical Python land. V video not available. So maybe, uh, maybe we're calling it too quickly, right? Maybe we're starting the transcription process too early and YouTube hasn't actually made the video available yet. So let's just start it again. Um, you can see all I passed into your uh, video. So uh, if it errors, I just start the process again. If it succeeds, then I download, I get the, uh, get the job outputs, which includes the files and the assets. I upload them to Airtable and then I, um, what does this do? Calls another webhook. Oh God, this is so bad. Trigger YT description update. So, okay, let's, let's assume that this is the name of a scenario. Oh my God, it better be. I should have had a number on it. Uh, here we go. YT description. Thank the Lord that I wrote a useful. Um, looks like it calls this automatically. That's kind of cool. That surprises me. I don't think that's correct. It doesn't matter. Um, okay, but the, here's the idea. It's essentially this pattern. I've called an outside service. That outside service supports webhooks, thank God, because only nice websites provide webhooks. And so I then get a callback into this one where I process it, pull the values out and put it in this here. So this chapter here and this one here will be blank until the job is succeeded eventually and then it'll be populated and then I'm good to go. Woo! This is how I've been building my YouTube videos to this point. I record as I'm doing now and very shortly I will finish recording. Uh, I will press Command, Alt uh, and R on my keyboard to finish recording. Um, it will convert it to an MP3 file. I will then manually press Create and upload it. Uh, and then I already have the thumbnail done because I did it in advance for you. Um, and uh, we should be good to go. This has been a big video. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed it, uh, give it a thumbs up, a like, um, subscribe, because it's it's the closest thing you can do picking up trash off the side of the road. It's the right thing to do. It's, it's a nice thing to do that makes the world just a little bit better. And um, I look forward to, uh, if you put your own videos out, let me know in the, the, the channel uh, chat so I can uh, know about you and, and I'll watch your videos. And uh, the nonetheless, I will make more and I'll see you in the next one.